BBC Television presents... Hancock. It's exciting, isn't it, Sid? Another day with Hancock's heroes. Who knows what it might bring? Each day is a fresh new revelation in the art of policing. What will it be? Let me think. Yes, another satisfied customer. I can't wait. More likely another dissatisfied customer. <laughs> now, now, Sergeant James, we're breaking new territory. Surrey's first private police force. You and me are going to go down in history. Like Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. Holmes and Watson. Or you never know, people might call us the new Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. <laughs> Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were outlaws. Some people told lies about them, apparently, Sid, but they were upstanding lawmen of their age. Anyway, in-laws, outlaws, what's the difference? <laughs> yeah, we got any customers today, or can I take a long tea break? Right, let me see. First up, by chance, is the proprietor of the Cozy Cafe in East Gym. Oh, good. I can see the first customer and have a long tea break. What's he gone and done? Put the milk in first or something? <laughs> oh, he's broken one of the new Covid bylaws, Sid, an outbreak of spontaneous dancing. Council want to make an example out of him as a warning to the rest of the community to have a bit of decorum during the pandemic. The police are too busy to handle it, probably filling out their overtime claim forms. You know. <laughs> I'll go and get him, shall I? And I'll get a better cup of tea and all. The tea you buy is all sweetmeats, Hancock. Sweepings? In that kitchen is the best PG tips that money can buy, mate. 1,000 bags for the princely sum of £2.50. Yeah, as I said, sweepings. There's a chimpanzee going around the floor of the PG tips factory with a broom that fills those bags you buy. He earns a bunch of bananas for every 50,000 bags he fills. <laughs> If you don't mind taking a seat, you're safe in the hands of Adcock's heroes now. We uphold the law, and we won't trample it underfoot. I'll take your name first. Sinjin St. John, Nigel Albertine Froth. Yes, very funny. Now what's your real name, and don't say Mickey Mouse. I've heard that one. That's it. That's the one of my birth certificate. People think I'm a bit soppy, but I'm not. So, what were your parents? Froths. Well, that explains it. Still, a name's a name, that's what I always say. It may be a stupid name, but it's yours, isn't it, Mr Froth? Yours by right and all that. Or it's an accident of fate or a trick of birth. Yeah, it's all right. You don't have to go on, don't you? <laughs> so, what have you done to incur the wrath of the council, Froth? You don't want to get on the wrong side of that lot. Before you know it, they'll have cancelled your lease and turned your shop into soft play area for guinea pigs. I don't know what the fuss is about. I was only dancing. I've got rhythm. I'm natural. I can't help it. We've heard it all before, matey. Yes, dancing on the tables, breaking crockery, causing a public disturbance. Anything else? Twerking? <laughs> no, I never done all that. I was just gyrating. So what constitutes gyrating in your book, Froth? Sounds a bit dodgy to me. Sexual like what pole dancers and strippers do. Are you trying to make out on some sort of pervert? No, you know sashaying, like on Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> sashaying, eh? What, handing out a sachet of milk here, a sachet of coffee creamer there? <laughs> of course not. What Elvis did? Old Swivel Hips, the king. I'm a bit of a rocker, you know. <laughs> Off your rock, I'm more like. I'm sorry, Frost, you've got to calm down. You can't do that anymore. It's verboten. This is the new reality. It's coronavirus. It means you're not supposed to shout, speak or breathe heavily. And absolutely no swiveling of the hips in case you spread the virus from you know where down there. The nether regions. But it's my cafe. I can do what I want, can't I? Anyway, the customers like it. They come back and watch and clap and they throw money at me. So they throw money at you, do they, Froth? And I throw it back. It hurts. <laughs> Well, there's a lot more malarkey going on than we were led to believe. Sounds like a flaming orgy. That makes it even worse. Flicking your mane about in a sensual manner like Elvis in a crowded room. That's it. You've just managed to double your fine. Double my fine? I gave him there seven cups of tea. I'd have thought you would have been grateful. They're very nice they were too, Froth. And to return the favour, Inspector Hancock will make you one of his special cups of tea. <laughs> Uh, 
There you are, Froth. Get that down, yeah. That will put the hairs on your chest. <laughs> oh, Lord, that's dreadful. I've a good mind to spit it out on the floor. Tasted like sweet beans to me. Hey, oh, I'd spit it out, cock. That's what I told you. Froth should know he runs a cafe. I think you will find, Froth, that this is not a good time to rub me up the wrong way, because it's time for the bill. That will be a £250 fine from the council for spontaneous dancing. £250 for our services, plus £2.50 for tea and biscuits. Stop messing about. That's outrageous. What about the seven cuts I gave him? I had to put on a fresh urn. He had a thirst that I just could not quench. <laughs> I'm afraid policing is thirsty work, Mr. Froth. So we'll just put those seven cups down as a bribe, shall we? Ha ha ha, old Froth thought he could get away with it, Sid. Not when Hancock's heroes are on the job, eh? 30 years of experience plus up-to-date policing techniques. Only the private police could afford. We can spot dirty dancing a mile off. <laughs> No one's going to get away with doing the rum bar bar when we're around, eh, Hancock? <laughs> so that's a £250 fine for doing the twist. And if you ask me, East Jeep counts are around the bloody twist. <laughs> right, let's see, who is the next client? Ah, here it is. It's a Mrs Pettifeather and her employee, Mr Pugh. Mr Pugh is refusing work because it's too hot and Mrs Pettifeather sacked him. Sounds like a fairly straightforward case then, Sergeant Jane. What's the law say then, Hancock? Don't know, haven't a clue. <laughs> we'll make it up as we go along as usual. Good evening, I'm Mrs Pettifeather. <laughs> Don't you mean Mr Pugh? I've got Mr. Pugh down as the man and Mrs. Pennyfeather down as a woman. I know who I am, thank you very much. Are you trying to gender label me? I'm non-binary. <laughs> I'm Mr. Pugh, as it happens. We're both gender fluid, especially in this weather. The heat, you know. Careful, Hancock. You've got to handle this carefully. I, I better do it. You know what you like with women, and you know what you like with men, and everyone else for that matter. <laughs> Don't you worry about me, Sergeant. I've been handling people like Mrs. Pennyweather for years. Don't you dare handle me. I'll belt you one. All right, let's not get eaten, shall we, Mr. Pugh? Why are you refusing to work? Because it's bloody hot, of course. I'm melting. It's over 35 degrees at home. I need air conditioning. So you're working from home. Why don't you open some windows then? I told him, Inspector Hancock, but he doesn't listen. That's his trouble. All men are the same. You can't tell them anything. He won't listen to me, and I'm supposed to be the boss. And that's sexism. That's another reason I'm downing tools. And what tools are we talking about, Mr Pugh? Computer, printer, filing cabinet. Computer? I'm a builder, mate. We're talking trowels, spades, cement mixers and jackhammers here. <laughs> All right, keep your hair on. It's not a wig, is it? <laughs> so you're working from home, you say? Doing what exactly? What do you think? Playing badminton? I'm trying to install some air conditioning. But you said you were working from your own home. How can you install air conditioning for a customer? from your own home. It's quite simple. Mr Pugh here asked my company, Petty Feathers and Daughters Construction Limited, to install some of our air conditioning in his home. <laughs> oh, why on earth is Mr Pugh having to do it? It's quite simple. None of our other builders are allowed round there because of the coronavirus restrictions. So he's got to do it himself. So if it's your own house, Mr Pugh, why don't you just crack on and do it? Because it's too flaming hot, and as I'm being employed to do it, it doesn't matter that it's my house. It's over 30 degrees centigrade, and that's against the law. It's too hot to work, so I've laid down tools. That's why you've got the sack. If you'd got on with it, it would have been done by now. You'd have had the air conditioning in place, and it would have been cool enough to work. It's not going to get any cooler until I put the air conditioning in. So I won't be able to work, will I? And it's not my my fault. <laughs> I think we're going round in circles here. I'm beginning to feel a bit dizzy. Right, Mr Pugh, I'm going to have to fine you both £500 for failing to provide a reasonable temperature at your place of work, plus our usual commission. But it's his place of work. I'm his employee. 
but it's also your place of work, which happens to be your home. And by stopping working, you are preventing it getting to the legal temperature. Oh, thank you, Inspector Hancock. You've got the wisdom of Solomon, you have. That's sorted that out. <coughs> you are still fired. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Here it is, Hancock, our next case. The police are sent along a man who's a bit iffy, but they don't consider him to be dangerous. But having said that, he's been stalking his dentist's arm with a crossbow. It sounds pretty dangerous to me. I don't think there is any need to get alarmed, Sid. I used to have a crossbow as a child. It fired little arrows with rubber suckers on. He's probably got one of those. <laughs> Good evening, I'm William Trowell. The police told me to report to you. Well, they said they'd have to throw the book at me. You're not going to throw a book at me, are you? I'll throw it back. <laughs> Don't worry, Trowell, there's no books here. Sid's had his library ticket confiscated. <laughs> oh, it's about your dentist, Mr Trowell. He thinks you're stalking him. Every time he turns around, you're there. He doesn't know why. Dr Simpson pulled out my tooth and he didn't give me an anaesthetic or nothing. I screamed and I screamed and I screamed. Ooh, I was in agony. Baking teeth out? Isn't that what dentists are supposed to do? I know, but I only went to the dentist to deliver a parcel. I work for Hermes, you see. And next minute I was in agony and he was waving two of my teeth about. So your dentist mistook you for a patient, Trell, and took out some teeth by mistake. This sort of thing happens, doesn't it? It's not a crime. Perhaps if you ask nicely, he might put them back for you. The man's a swine. He laughed and said, that will teach you before swallowing my two teeth. He said I was having an affair with his wife. It wasn't a mistake at all. <laughs> So, oh, Trell, you've been following the dentist around with a crossbow in order to put the wind up him a bit, and that's your way of getting revenge, is it? I'm not trying to scare him. I'm going to shoot him with my crossbow. Yes, the crossbow. The police mentioned it. One of those little plastic ones with rubber suction cups, isn't it? Like what I used to have. <laughs> I don't think you can kill someone with rubber suction cups. No, it's a proper one I've got with 20-inch bolts. I've got it outside. I'll show you how it works. Wait a minute. I think I've got a toothache coming on. I always start to get a bit angry when I have a toothache. It reminds me of dentists. I'll go and get me crossbow and give you a demonstration. <coughs> Quick, Sid. Lock the door. We'll go out the back way. I think the Surrey police have sent us the local maniac. They're trying to put us out of business. <laughs> So, just another day at the office, when Hancock's heroes met the ardent criminals of East Sheem head on and came off best. Well, I did. Sergeant James will be out of hospital in a couple of weeks when they find the best way to remove the crossbow bolt from his backside. <laughs>